Welcome back to Economics. This is Dr. Kling, and today's topic is monetarism. You've probably heard the expression, inflation is too much money chasing too few goods. And that's, uh, you can easily visualize that in the case of hyperinflation. So here are a few images of hyperinflation. Uh, I guess this is somebody just throwing out old money. It's not worth much. Somebody with uh, burning money because it's more useful to be burned. There's somebody with a wheelbarrow full of money. Um, and here's what happened to wholesale prices during the Weimar Germany hyperinflation. Let's take more of a look at this. Okay, so they... This is in just one year, 1923, the wholesale price index goes from a thousand to over, I want to say that's a billion, something like that. That is a very big uh, hyperinflation. Okay, so what, uh, <coughs> so there's, there's a, certainly during a hyperinflation, there is a close relationship between the vast amounts of money that get printed and the uh, soaring prices, where prices go up by uh, orders of magnitude. Still, I'm going to say that I don't think the, that the root cause of hyperinflation is money per se. It's actually <coughs> fiscal problems. So a government, when it's spending money, can finance spending with taxes, by borrowing, or by printing money. Those are all the ways to finance government spending. And what happens in a hyperinflation is that the taxes are not enough to cover spending and the government can't collect any more in taxes. People will not lend to the government and so all it's left <coughs> to do is to print money. And when it prints money it's able to purchase stuff but it dri that drives up prices and so then it has to print more money so the prices go up so it has to print more in order to keep buying goods and services. And then you get into this vicious cycle where printing more money, prices going up, printing more money, prices going up. And it just gets out of control because people can see what's happening. They can see that money is becoming worth less and less. So they want to spend it faster and faster, get rid of it faster and faster. They're, they are more and more reluctant to take it. They want to charge, merchants want to charge higher and higher prices in money terms because the money is becoming, they can see that the money is becoming worth less every day. And it just gets out of control and that's the hyperinflation phenomenon. And the only way you end the hyperinflation is by doing something about the relationship between government spending and taxes. So usually governments will <coughs> will balance their budget all of a sudden and issue a new currency and with the balanced budget and the new currency people trust money again and the hyperinflation stops. So that's sort of the extreme story of too much money chasing too few goods. That's hyperinflation. Um, but monetarism takes the view that that relationship between money and the economy pretty much holds all the time. So if we could do it in terms of aggregate supply and aggregate demand, one version of monetarism is that is that out the aggregate supply is vertical. Now we've seen that in our standard textbook model the aggregate supply curve is vertical in the long run. That is in the long run we think output will converge on this 
natural rate of output, which we'll call y bar. The, and the aggregate demand, in the monetarist point of view, comes from money. from the supply of money. And so when any shifts in aggregate demand just change the prices. You can see if, if you were stuck with output equal to Y bar and you raise aggregate demand, all you do is raise prices. So there's just a relationship between money and prices. And we can express that. There's a the American version of monetarism goes like this: MV equals PY. P is the average price level. Think of this as the GDP deflator. Y is real output. So this is real GDP. P is the price level, the average price level. Think of this as the GDP deflator. V is something called the velocity of money, how fast it turns over in the economy. Uh, <coughs> and then M is the supply of money. So if we fix V and fix Y equals to Y bar, fixing means just V is a constant. It doesn't, uh, it doesn't vary or it, it just moves progressively over time as people get more efficient with using money, but it, it do, it's just uh, completely separate from the evolution of P and Y, <coughs> then what we have is a relationship that just boils down to a relationship between money and prices. And that, that's what we depicted here in this diagram. So that's a kind of a strong version of monetarism. I, I mentioned this is the American version. The British version of monetarism goes like this, that, <coughs> that money is proportional to a constant K of nominal income. P times Y is nominal income. So if you multiply the price level times real GDP, you're getting nominal income. And then you multiply it by some constant, and that sort of gives you the relationship between money and nominal income. All right, so but those are the same thing. The the K serves the same function as the V in these equations. Now you can also have a softer version of monetarism where we have an aggregate. We still have this long run vertical aggregate supply curve, but we allow a short run aggregate supply curve that isn't vertical. It will over time converge to, to the vertical one, but uh, it can be temporarily upward sloping. And then you can have um, aggregate demand as it's determined by money. And now what happens is if you raise aggregate demand to some higher level, we get more real GDP in the short run, because we're moving along the short run aggregate supply curve, as well as higher prices. So there's this sort of softer version of monetarism in which uh, aggregate demand matters, but the main determinant of aggregate demand in this softer version of monetarism is money. So we've been talking about government spending and tax cuts as the big drivers of aggregate demand. In a monetarist view, the big driver of aggregate demand would be the money supply. One interesting thing about monetarism is that before 1970, there were almost no monetarists. So before 1970 in the U.S., or let, let's say between World War II and 1970, so from 1945 to 1970, there were almost no monetarists. That is, there were very few people who were focused on a relationship between money and prices. Instead, remember we had the Phillips curve to determine inflation. <coughs> and a focus of on government spending and taxes 
to determine aggregate demand. And so <coughs> you had so you didn't have this money prices relationship in the thinking of economists, most economists between 1945 and 1970. The one exception, the prominent exception, was Milton Friedman, who was a uh, who would say that inflation is everywhere and always a monetary phenomenon. Then in the 1970s, people, uh, policymakers tried to influence the Phillips curve using price controls. So we had wage and price controls, price controls and wage controls. And the verdict was this: those policies failed. Uh, by the end of the 1970s, inflation <coughs> and unemployment were both much worse than when those policies were first started. And so, uh, late in 1979, um, there was there was a change at the Fed. Uh, Paul Volcker was appointed chairman. And he was given something of a mandate to reduce inflation. So for the first time, uh, <coughs> the Fed was told to try to focus on reducing inflation. So he began to do that, Paul Volcker began to do that, but there was an interruption because of the 1980 election. So with the 1980 being an election year, uh, early in that year, <coughs> with the economy sh showing rising unemployment, the Fed s took a pause in its efforts to reduce inflation and allowed uh, and pursued a more expansionary policy. So you can think of this as um, aggregate demand at first reducing it when Volcker first comes in, but then very soon afterward they, they start increasing aggregate demand because it's an election year. They think that's going to be bad to have a, a recession in an election year. Then the election's over. Ronald Reagan becomes president, and Reagan tells, <coughs> tells Volcker, and Volcker is perfectly happy to do this, let's just really take care of inflation. I'm not going to worry about what that what that means in the short run to the economy. So in so starting in about 1981 we get some very sharp drop very sharp drop in aggregate demand in 1981 and <coughs> that goes on for about two years and inflation goes from about 10 percent per year down to about four percent per year so it really does uh, take care wring the inflation out of the system and sort of for the next 20 years uh, the economy does reasonably well I mean the, the initial wringing out of inflation sends in unemployment up to close to 10 percent but then after a while it comes back down and if you believe in the theory of that the short run aggregate supply kept shifting back to a to the point where we got to a well that's not a good line don't do that to a um, to a, a kind of a long run where well, where you're to the natural level of output. So the so monetarism seemed to work very well at that point, and since then many economists have adopted a monetarist point of view. <coughs>